Hi, Jack. I think I saw. Hey. I thought I saw Kevin here a minute ago. Is he here? Um, I'm here, but I'm doing some chores, so I will turn my video off again. So I don't oh. distract you by zipping in and out of the frame. Okay, I get it. I do that too. <laughs> So when are you taking off, Jacques? Uh, tomorrow, actually. Um, tomorrow afternoon. And where were you going? Actually going to Mexico. <laughs> I think you told me that. I knew I knew, but I couldn't remember. I knew I had heard. We've had the trip planned for months and months and just kind of been on the fence and, and finally decided to, we, I think we can do it pretty safely. And uh, yeah. Oh, I know. It's, yeah, it's, it's always more challenging to decide what to do as far as travel right now. Yeah, so much more, so much more. Hey, Mary, this is Mallory. Um, I went ahead and started recording and streaming on YouTube. Oh, okay, so I won't say anything obscene. <laughs> <laughs> Preferably not. Preferably not. Preferably not. <laughs> Preferably or whatever. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. I have a draft for that letter to, in support of naming the school after Margaret Hoffman. I sent it to Trish, Trisha, because she was the one that wanted to do the letter and she's gonna look it over. So hopefully you'll get it before the end of the day. Sounds good, thanks Mary. Is, is Sarah still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Hmm. Not showing up on my screen, but that does, I can hear you. Who are, who are we waiting for, Chris? I'm waiting for you. <laughs> oh, I thought you were running the orientation. Oh, well, you're gonna call the meeting to order. Oh, okay. Okay, because it's okay. I will call this uh, special meeting to order. The time is 104. Uh, present are uh, Commissioner Mary McGann, uh, uh, Jacques uh, Hadler, Kevin Walker, Sarah Stock. Uh, staff, Mallory Nassau and Chris Baird and Quinn Hall and Renee Baker. Uh, I will be turning the meeting over. This is a meeting for orientation for new commissioners and a refresher for commissioners that have been on for a while. <laughs> so I will hand it over to Chris. I hope you're, I hope you're well <laughs> and stay well. Well, I'm quarantined, so, um, but I'm well, so. <laughs> but yeah, a little disadvantage because I'm gonna have to do this from home, but uh, we'll, we'll proceed uh, as best we can. And, um, I would just suggest that if you have questions, just uh, interrupt me while I'm going and, and ask them. And so um, we'll just proceed through the agenda the way that, that it's written. But if somebody um, wants to rearrange any of these items, um, you know, I think that that's fine also. Um, I didn't really put a lot of thought into their uh, prioritization. And, but um, we'll start off with the form of government. I'll see if I can share my screen so we can just breeze through it. I'm going to do just the, the 101 version of, uh, of everything, or try to anyway. And let's see, I've got multiple zooms going here, so I have to get to the right one. Hey, Chris, it's Quinn. Quick question. Do we need minutes for this? Yeah. Okay. I mean, they don't. They don't have to be ultra detailed. You can just say discussion of blah, blah, blah. No problem. Thanks. <clears throat> Let's see here. Having a hard time finding the. The right zoom thing. I have a budget, I have an advisory board for USU at two, so I'll bow out at two, and then after it's done, it usually doesn't take long, I'll see if this uh, orientation is still going on and re rejoin. Okay. 
All right. So um, as you're probably aware, we amended our form of government last year. Um, and the uh, predominant change is to, you know, to get rid of three provisions for recall elections, uh, term limits, and uh, let's see, what was the other one? <laughs> Kevin's on here. Um, Nonpartisan elections. So those three things uh, were taken out of our form of government. We also changed uh, the title from county council to county commission. Uh, those are really the main changes. Uh, the role of the governing body was made more generic. Um, and so uh, a lot of the previous provisions still exist in, in county policy, but they're taken out of the form of government. And uh, everything else is largely the same. We still have seven members, four by or uh, five by district, two at large. <clears throat> And a lot of the uh, code sections were updated to more modern references. So cleaned a lot of that up. Um, I think that that kind of covers it. it. One of the things to realize is that the commissioners have both executive and legislative authority. One of the things about county government, however, is that uh, Commissioners don't have full executive authority because uh, there are several other independently elected officials and they have their own kind of portion of the county's executive authority. And so the way that code reads, it does spell out some executive authorities uh, for the commission specifically, but it also says that all the other executive authorities that may need to be exercised that are not um, mentioned in the other elected officials role are also the responsibility of the commission. So there's quite a few things that aren't really mentioned um, in, in code uh, that we have like personnel services, a uh, variety of, of administrative objectives. So a lot of that stuff falls under the commission. So HR payroll is now under the commission, um, you know, due to interpreting code that it, those things are not specified as responsibilities of any other elected official, so they fall on the commission. And some of these things can also be delegated to, um, to other elected officials. Technically speaking, um, accounting and finance is a commission responsibility. That's somewhat split at this point between uh, clerk auditor and myself as budget officer, um, and that's fine, and that's, you know, within the ability of the commission to uh, split the finances out. And in smaller counties, it's pretty common to have a clerk auditor as the chief financial officer. And so that's more or less how things are set up with us. So does anybody have any um, questions about the form of government itself? Would you give an example of something on the agenda, a motion that would be an exec executive decision as, uh, in, as compared to a legislative? Uh, yeah, I'll, well, no, I'll kind of explain the difference generally in a nutshell. I mean, for the most part, legislative is gonna to relate to law. And, and the vast majority of the time when we pass an ordinance as opposed to a resolution or a, a motion, it's because we intend it to be legislative. Um, the, there are some duties that are kind of a split, like for instance, budgeting. The preparation of the tentative budget is an executive function and the adoption of the budget is a legislative function. And so the commission's involved in both aspects of that and they, but they wear different hats at different times. And so, when the commission adopts the tentative budget, they're doing that with their executive hat on. And then when they approve it, they're doing it with their legislative hat on. Um, so there's certain, like for instance, uh, with uh, land use code applications, um, rezones are legislative. And uh, most of the other types of uh, approvals are administrative or executive in nature. Um, there's also some precedent um, that establishes certain 
actions as executive or legislative, but they don't necessarily fall within simple guidelines. And so you do sometimes have to just look at any kind of precedent for how they're interpreted or judicial case law to try to determine if something's executive or legislative. It's not always super clear. Um, <clears throat> but generally speaking, if we're gonna pass an ordinance, we're intending it to be a law. And if we're passing a resolution or just making motions, um, then, then we intend it to be executive. Um, so the vast majority of the agenda items are executive in nature. And the most common legislative action would be something related to a, a land use code uh, zoning change or you know, a, an update to our ordinances. Does that help, Mary? Yes, some you know. I, sometimes when I'm going over the agenda, I'm wondering. I ask myself those two questions. Thank you. All right. So let me see if I can change to a different screen. I think this one. No, that's not it. Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, policies and procedures of the governing body. And this is, you know, something that you'll all want to read pretty closely. I'll just, you know, hit the highlights on it. These are the policies and procedures that are geared specifically towards the commission. Let me get up to the top here. So there's some definitions in here that you want to pay attention to um, with the council members, the first meeting in January, election of the vice chair and the chair. There's still in here, you know, a, a recommendation to try to appoint a different chair every year. We don't always, aren't always able to do that or it's not preferable, but it's not mandatory. Um, council members are expected to, you know, attend meetings to, you know, their greatest uh, ability. Um, there's quite a few different local, state, and federal committees, and council members are encouraged to participate in them. Um, one of the one of the things to realize also about county letterhead is that it's intended only for official communications um, that are you know established based on the uh, com the commission's majority vote or a quorum vote, <clears throat> and so if you do want to use county letterhead for any kind of communication, just realize that it, it really should um, be in relation to uh, the position of at least four members of the commission as per a vote in a public meeting. And then this other one here, number five, council communications. Uh, there's been some issues in the past where um, commissioners have expressed their own personal opinion, but not made it clear that that opinion was not reflective of the majority or official position of the county commission. And so what this section is getting at is that if you do, if you are expressing an opinion that hasn't been officially adopted by the commission, uh, you know, as per a quorum vote in an open meeting, that you try to delineate that that's just your opinion and not the opinion of the full Grand County Commission. And that's, you know, caused quite a bit of problem in the past. And so, you know, just be mindful of that, that if you're expressing your own opinion, it's not the official opinion of the commission that you try to delineate that. Uh, with electronic communications, we can get into this a little bit more also if we, you know, get to the Open Meetings Act. Um, but just realize that if you're discussing the public's business and you're an elected official, that your communications, regardless of what device you're using, whether it be a personal device or a county device, 
or a personal email or a county email, those communications are subject to the to the um, the state's government records access management act. And so, if a grandma comes in, you're not shielded by discussing the public's business by using a personal email account or a personal cell phone or anything like that. So just be just realize that if you are discussing the public's business, that's a, a record that somebody could um, present um, a grammar request for, and by law you'd have to submit. So keep that in mind when you're communicating, and also realize that if uh, a quorum of elected officials are discussing um, the public's business electronically, that could constitute a meeting. And if you didn't post that meeting and make it available to the public, uh, then that could be a violation of the Open Meetings Act. And so um, we generally discourage discussion with four or more commissioners via email or other electronic means. So just realize that that could be considered a meeting by open meeting standards. <clears throat> and it's certainly uh, also, you know, subject to grammar. So Chris, on, on that, I, there was some handbook that I've seen in, in older versions of this, you know, I, I think it was written by Gavin Anderson or something, but it was a bit were that, and in that discussion of the Open Meetings Act, it emphasizes, you know, like the importance of it being convened. And it, anyway, it sounded somewhat narrower in there. So I'm just wondering if you had more to say about, you know, the difference between an actual meeting and chance gatherings and that, I mean, how, how well defined is that line? Uh, well, we'll have to, I mean, we, we really should rely on the exact wording of the Open Meetings Act. And I'm not sure if that was included in the packet or not. Um, but uh, if it is, we can go over it or I can, you know, pull it, pull that exact language and send it out to everybody later. In a lot of cases like this, I definitely recommend reading statute, relevant statute and following it to the letter. Um, and it changes every year too. So. That's another thing too, you know, it's pretty common for Open Meetings Act, grandma uh, laws to get amended during the legislative session. And so you always have to remember to pay attention to any bills that pass that are relative to those um, and not rely on your institutional knowledge of statute without making sure that you're up to date on any changes but I'm, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at or what you're asking, but um, we can go over the exact, you know, statute itself. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have to go over it right now, but I, I guess I was, um, and, and your point about these things take, you know, that's a point well taken about the statutes changing from time to time. But I, I guess I, I, to me, there's always been a contrast between, you know, the sort of popular understanding of the Open Meetings Law Act and and where, you know, where to draw the line and the discussion that was in this, I think it was put out by UAC or something um, that, you know, that it, it is going through the statute word by word. And, um, and anyway, maybe I can just ask you privately later. Okay. Yeah. And and just real so quick on the email communications, like for example, Christina Sloan sent us all as commission members an email. Is that like, well, you can all receive emails. It's just a matter of whether or not you discuss them. Um, so then if we replied all and started talking, that is technically a meeting. Could be, yeah. And so, um, and you especially don't want to come, come to any conclusions or make any decisions via email. That's for sure. Okay. But even discussion uh, could be construed as a meeting. And so... You know, it's generally frowned upon to even discuss the public's business via email if there's uh, four or more commissioners in, included. Um, so, you know, just be, be careful about that uh, because the Open Meetings Act um, intends that such discussion happen in open session and be available to the public. But another thing to realize is that communications with the county attorney are um, 
protected and they are not subject to grammar. So the only way that uh, any communication to the county attorney would have to be provided to the public is if a judge subpoenaed that information or if the judge requested that information be provided to the public, which is possible um, if there's a prevailing public interest in it. And, and that would, Chris, that would include if, like Sarah said, uh, four or more of us are on the same uh, email communications with Christina and we go back and forth a little bit. Uh, well, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know that, I mean, it's, it's protected in, in, with regard to grandma, but how it relates to the Open Meetings Act, I'm not really sure. Right, right. Um, one, one other question about grandma, just to be perfectly clear. For example, yesterday I was texting with uh, Commissioner Clapper about a committee that he was on last year, and I was just texting him for advice that something like that would fall under grandma. Yes. Right, okay. And so, I mean, there's a number of exemptions to grandma, things that are protected, um, but they're limited. And so m most communications that you'd be engaged with are probably um, subject to a grammar request. Right. There's some, some things that aren't, but most are. And, you know, you're, it's, you're, you're safest to assume that it is right, unless yeah. you predetermine that it's not. <clears throat> and so you know the it's better safe than sorry i guess i would say okay um email policy this just you know says that each council member will get an email and then you know there's certain emails that we automatically forward on to the the whole commission um and that uh and this is something we can work out and maybe have to talk with Matt Seneceros, our IT guy about, but in here in this policy, it says that, um, you know, a, a prior uh, commission members emails um, should be forwarded to their successor. Um, and it might be a good idea. So, you know, to, to look into that because if, um, the prior commissioner was engaged in business with another entity or, or whatever, and they had important communication, you know, we'd want to make sure that that came through and didn't just end up in a, a folder that nobody reads. So <clears throat> that's something we might have to work on uh, with Matt. So the, the county commission is also the board of our municipal building authority, which is the board that we do most of our loans through our, our bonds. Um, and it's, uh, it's also the entity that we um, send if we if we are the recipient of mineral lease revenue, usually via the community impact board, um, we'll pass that through the municipal building authority. Because any mineral lease revenue that we take in into the county uh, could potentially offset our federal payment in lieu of taxes by that exact re respective amount. Um, we're also, you're also the board of equalization and that's regarding property tax appeals. So um, Quinn will send out um, valuations to everybody in the county that come, you know, that are um, produced by the county assessor and then uh, sends those out, I think in June, they have, I think by September to appeal that value. And we have actually an officer that hears all of those cases and makes recommendations to the Board of Equalization, which is you. And so um, those recommendations will come to you for approval. And then, you know, if there are other outstanding Board of Equalization issues, you'll uh, serve in that capacity. Um, one other board um, that you serve as is the Thompson Springs Special Service Fire District. That's not a matter of policy. It's just kind of that we haven't really found any effective way to run that district um, or to get members. 
And so currently the commission is serving as that board, although we hope to not have that last forever and get that resolved pretty soon. Chris, I had a question about the Board of Equalization um, or more generally about assessment. I've, I've had some people ask me about that. Is there some document that describes just the process they go through for determining the valuations of, of properties? Um, you know, some... There might be. Um, I have to ask Debbie Swayze about if she has something like that. Okay, so maybe uh, I should. There, there is. There's actually a couple different ways of establishing revenue or not revenue, but um, valuation. And one of them is by is revenue based for businesses usually. Um, but the other is just, you know, a basic um, uh, valuation, um, you know, similar to if you um, wanted an appraisal on your property, we use a person that is an appraiser to go and just, you know, establish um, values based on the data that they have, market data. It can be difficult in Utah because we're a non-disclosure state, but they do have data points. And so they use comparables um, to establish value usually. So in, so in theory then the, the assessed value is supposed to be the same as the market value? It's supposed to be within 10% by state law. Okay. And uh, so, anyway, but that's the assessor's duty there, and she might be able to help you out with more okay. clearing. Yeah, Chris and, and Kevin, having worked with Debbie a little bit, I know that there's two different methods that she uses, a couple of different comparison methods, and then there are the comparables that Chris talked about. Debbie's actually pretty good at knowing the difference between the two. I, I could, uh, there's a couple of names for them, but yeah, they're, they're all in writing and they, sometimes she uses those in in comparison with the comparables to determine the value. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, tip, the typical constituent question I get is either about a discrepancy between an assessed value and a market value, or discrepancies between you know assessed values of two fairly similar houses. That that kind of thing. I, I just realized I didn't know you know how often such things happen. Yeah. No, and you're you're correct. But typically, the assessed value is lower than market value. And yeah, ideally it's supposed to be within 10%, but sometimes it's even a little bit lower than that. Anyway, um, moving on to county boards, commissions, committees, local and special service district representation. So as you just you know went through the process of assignment um, to all these boards in your first meeting, um, each board is different um, each service div district is different. They all have their own bylaws and charter that establish them. So it's really impossible to give you a, you know, one single explanation for them all and, and the commissioner's role on each of them. You have to look at each one individually to understand the commissioner's role on all those boards. In some cases, they're an actual voting board member. In other cases, they're ex officio, which means that they can participate in discussions, but they can't vote. Sometimes we refer to them as liaisons, and a liaison generally just means that you're there to present the commission's position on issues to that board, and then to relay to the commission that board's issues and positions. And so it's kind of a, just a messenger. Um, and so it really varies depending on the appointment, what the commissioner's role is, but you really kind of want to figure that out for all the appointments that you have, you know, what your role is specifically. And, and I can help you out with that, um, individually. Um, but it does vary. And so I just wanted to make sure you realize that. And hey. then, um, number nine. Hey, Chris, one question on the boards. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been to a few, and, and when we relay the, uh, you know, kind of what's going on at the boards at the at the general uh, commission meetings, um, what are, what are some of the major points to mention? Uh, just just the absolute most important things that were going over at, at that particular board, or you know that they held elections and new members were elected, or just a little bit of guidance on on what might be appropriate to bring back to the committee. Or to the commission. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you have to use your discretion. Um, right. Otherwise, those reports could be really long. Um, 
And so I'll just say hit the highlights and especially relay information that's relevant to the commission itself or the public, you know, if the public, if it's something of public's interest, but you don't want to report on every little tiny detail. Um, yeah, sure. So yeah, user discretion, I guess, with regard to hitting the highlights. And then uh, number nine here, council member involvement in operational issues. Um, and so, you know, this used to be memorialized in the form of government, but now it's just in policy. So the um, county, uh, and, and just as a note, when we, re when we revise these policies and procedures, we'll replace council with commission. Um, but county commission's role is predominantly legislative and extensive involvement in day-to-day -day operations is discouraged. So um, there's there, a little bit further down, there's also some policy relating to providing direction to staff. And uh, we'll go over that. But in general, you know, basically, if a commissioner would like to direct staff, they uh, need to get the approval of at least four members of the commission in open meeting to direct staff. Um, there's been quite a bit of turmoil in the past where um, commissioners will independently try to direct staff without getting the consent of the rest of the commission. And that causes a lot of problems. As you can imagine, if I had seven bosses telling me seven different things to do, it would be impossible to do my job. So we always wanna make sure that if a commissioner wants to direct staff, that it's you know the actual will of the, of the commission itself, uh, at least four of them. And Chris, do you think that needs to be a formal vote or could it just be like a head nod or straw poll at an open meeting? Um, like for example, telling the planning commission, yes, we'd like you to explore the following options or something like that. Um, well, the planning commission's not staff, but... Um, the planning staff. Then. No, I think that probably something informal is fine, just as long as we get, you know, get it in an in a open meeting. Okay, so it just needs to be- And I think it kind of depends too on the, you know, the situation. Um, you know, if it's something contentious or whatever, then it's probably best to have a vote. Uh, but, or, you know, we're trying to, it just depends on, you know, I think the, the significance of what's being directed. Okay. And again, I maybe just user discretion, but, you know, it, at least, you know, some informal um, head nod of four would be good just so that I that I and, and other staff know that we're not um, following the direction of a commissioner if it's not you know the the will of the full of the board okay at least a majority let's see so this part just covering um, what you went through last time to a point um, yourselves to these different assignments. I will say that it's not unusual for kind of a shakedown to happen after a month or two where commissioners say, well, you know, this isn't really working for me schedule wise, or, you know, this board's not my cup of tea. I'd like to trade it out. And so it's not unusual for some switching around to happen. Um, and I guess I would just say, you know, if you if you find yourself in that scenario where you're not able to make a board meeting or you're just not into it, that you work with your other commissioners to see if you can like switch roles or change, change, you know, your appointments or whatever. There's no real formal policy about that. It's just generally, you know, commissioners work together uh, to coordinate changes like that. And then, you know, in a meeting, we'll just approve that change. So just to realize they're not locked in stone. Um, and if something's not working out, you know, there's a possibility to, to change it. Uh, this is kind of redundant here, council members role on boards. Again, you kind of have to determine by, by the board you're on what your role is and it could vary. And then this section here, um, is just discussing uh, make providing reports um, to these boards. We've we've had some issue with council members attending boards and not relaying relevant information, and so um, it you know it, it's it is pretty important to 
try to make a point of relaying relevant information from the boards and committees that you're on and, and other agencies. And if something's important and the rest of the commission should know, um, you know, the policy really strongly encourages that, that those reports be made, you know, regardless of whether or not you think the, you know, the commission, or what direction the commission would take on the matter. And then this other one, you know, uh, council member participation. I guess this is a kind of a, uh, to be frank, a little bit derived from some te to ter territorialism that's happened in the past where we've had an official member to a board and then another member that wanted to be on that board. So they both end up attending, but they have differing opinions or viewpoints on the matter. Um, so there's, you know, some attempt, I guess, to get these two commissioners, if they both are interested in a board, but have some um, disagreement about things to work together. And if um, one commissioner wants to uh, attend a board meeting that another commissioner is the official representative of to, to notify their interest to that person or to that commissioner. Chris, do you know what, what year that provision was put in? Uh, I mean, is it recent or like 15 years ago? Mm. I think it was fairly recent. Yeah, it's pretty recent. I believe uh, it, ha it came about when mm -hmm. Lynn Jackson uh, went to a some uh, the health district board meeting. As, and uh, that's, I think that was, if I remember, that's when we looked at the policies and started changing them. I came on right, right after that happened and we changed it that year. So the other, the other issue, you know, has to do with even if two commissioners are in agreement with one another, for the most part, if you're assigned to an official position on a board, you can't have somebody sub in for you and vote in your stead. It's usually against the bylaws um, for most boards uh, to have somebody sub for an official position and vote or, or participate in closed sessions. And so this policy right here also says that council members not assigned as council represent, representatives attending meetings shall participate in members of the public. So that just means you can't sub in for somebody else. Um, and if you are there, you know, in somebody else's stead that you're more there playing the role of a member of the public. Again, you know, the, there's past issues that may or may not occur again that kind of created this bit of policy or the need for this bit of policy. Um, in some cases, you know, maybe subbing is allowed, but like I say, in most cases, it's not by the bylaws of the board you're on. So just be aware of that. Then uh, kind of committees, we oftentimes, you know, we'll establish a variety of committees for a variety of purposes. Some are more for formal than others. Um, and so in some cases, you know, when we establish committees that we want to last for a long time and be more formal, when we approve them, we'll approve them with bylaws and the whole kit and caboodle. And oftentimes they'll have to comply with the Open Meetings Act. You know, in some cases we want just short term study committees formed. And then, you know, we, we do that in a less formal manner. We don't approve bylaws and whatnot if we expect it to be just a temporary study committee or a, a you know, a committee that's temporary for any reason. So it kind of depends, um, but oftentimes, you know, it's good to confer with myself and Christina Sloan about the idea of a committee and whether or not it needs bylaws or, or needs to comply with the Open Meetings Act. But um, it's pretty common for us to spin some committees out um, for various purposes. Special service districts, um, they all, like I said, they all have their own charter. And so the membership and makeup of service districts um, varies from district to district and the commissioner's roles on those boards varies. Sometimes they're a full on voting member, sometimes they're ex officio or liaison role. 
Um, one thing to realize about special service districts, though, is that um, while the commission has the power to appoint members or provide funding as per the charter that established them, they're not, we're not allowed, the commission is not allowed to direct operations or to, you know, and tell them how to spend their money. So they're an independent political subdivision of the state of Utah. And so just realize that the, the county doesn't have the ability to direct operations or direct how they spend their money. But we do have some control over the membership on the boards, you know, and if we send them money, how much money we send them, that kind of thing we have control over. Another thing on, on districts, the auditor uh, of uh, uh, dis the district's solid waste special service district, but it applies to all districts. They prefer to not have the county person on the board be the chair. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I, you know, yeah, I was the chair of the solid waste special service district and uh, I was encouraged by the auditor to let somebody else do that. So I think that's more a matter of perception, perhaps. I don't think it's an actual law, but you know, from the standpoint of trying to provide, you know, clear distinction between um, the counties, or you know, just to provide their autonomy or the appearance of autonomy. Yeah, that was for the autonomy, and also, you know, uh, to keep from having the appearance of, you know, counter. Uh, opinions or that are you representing the county in this situation or the district just yeah so chris do, do you have at your fingertips some kind of um summary of the federal laws behind this you know the revenue streams and why it can't all that stuff my god well i think it's actually a state law um okay. Okay. no maybe it's federal i don't know i'd have to get get at it it's buried um mineral lease the revenue laws, if that's what you're getting at, um, are really complicated. And the plumbing for how mineral lease is dispersed uh, is also really complicated through the state. I did yeah. make a flow chart several years ago that's probably still mostly accurate. Um, that helps out a lot. But well, if you still had a copy of that, I'd be interested. Yeah, to see. I'll, I'll try to dig it up um, if I have it. I lost a lot of those old files when the fire, when my all my stuff burned up, but um, uh, the reason you may recall that um, last year we didn't get our full federal PILT appropriation. And, you know, I, I immediately understood what the problem was, um, even though UX public lands attorney, you know, claims that he figured it out. I knew right away what was wrong. Um, the state pays their PILT. They don't actually call it PILT, but it's more or less PILT. You know, their payment in lieu of taxes on state lands and counties using federal mineral lease money. And so they were sending the money to us, that state PILT, and then we took that money and immediately distributed it out to other um, entities. And so we didn't re retain any of that money. But in the states reporting to the federal government, um, retained mineral lease money um, offsets your federal payment in lieu of taxes allocation. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with that. They, they, the state reported to the federal government that we'd retained that state PILT money, about 300,000, and we didn't retain it. We passed it through. And so that's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, when there's a report of retention of mineral lease monies, um, the federal government will deduct that from our PILT. And there, there is a law about it somewhere. I'm not sure where, but I can get it. So here's the duties of the chair. Um, so the chair, you know, is, is intended to be a position that doesn't have any particular extra power, but rather just, you know, to, um, set the agendas and run the meetings, uh, you know, and sign documents on behalf of decisions that at least 
um, four members of the commission have voted in favor of. And then, you know, um, to work closely with myself and Mallory and other staff on um, affecting the decisions that the commission's made. Uh, the vice chair, you know, serves in the stead of the, of the chair upon the chair's request um, or if the chair is absent, you know, so um, the backup, the backup. And then, you know, in the absence of a chair and a vice chair, the members can appoint a chair pro tem. And then um, this is kind of getting at the study committee, the chair at his or her discretion oversees the membership and proper functioning of the council study committees. And so those would be the, you know, the really informal committees. Uh, chair shall have control of the council chambers, commission chambers now. Um, there is, you know, this is somewhat derived from, from statute also. You know, the chair has some powers to direct, for instance, sheriff's deputies in the event of disorderly conduct and whatnot. Um, the chair shall preserve order and decide all points of order and procedures subject to appeal of the membership. So, um, you know, the process for dealing with uh, issues of points of order, which is, you know, a point of order is basically somebody um, calls out a parliamentary procedure and either the chair uh, upholds that or they don't. And uh, the commission as a whole can actually override the chair on a point of order. Um, but it requires a process. I think, I'm not sure if it's a majority vote or a super majority vote, but they can vote to overrule the chair on a point of order. And that's a part of Robert's rules. Um, roll call vote. This is, you know, when we um, want to make it really clear in the audio recording who voted what way. Uh, so the chair will call out uh, each commissioner's name and then they say yes or no, A or nay, however you want to do it. Um, there's really, as far as I know, there's actually no state law that requires a roll call vote. Um, but state law does require that the, in the minutes, how everybody voted is recorded. And that's really for every, every action that the commission takes. Um, it can make it a little easier, um, for somebody listening to the recording to make that assessment. Um, but the way that we always take our minutes, um, you can deduce how everybody votes by the way we, we take our minutes. But in a roll call vote situation, it's more obvious on the recording. So Chris, you're saying that you do not need a roll call vote for the bills? No. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that we need, and this is not just for the bills, but for every motion that's made, is that it be clear in the minutes how everybody voted. And that's for every decision that's made. And that's how we do it. Um, sometimes you have to deduce that if, if we don't have full membership, you know, present, um, then sometimes, you know, we, they call out who voted in, in opposition and, and abstain. And sometimes you have to deduce who voted for by going up and looking who was present. Um, but it's deducible. I mean, we could change that too if we wanted to call out the, the those in favor as well. We always call out who voted against and who uh, abstained. And then we kind of leave it up to the deduction powers of those reading who voted, voted in favor. But regardless, it's required that we record how everybody voted in the minutes. So commissioners that are on the call, uh, what do you think about continuing the roll call vote for the bills or should we do a simple uh, all in favor? I mean, it doesn't take that much longer, but it does take more time than to just call Since for the bills. Those, those usually aren't controversial votes, so I would think. Yeah, you don't have to. I mean, we can talk about it that later in a meeting or something, but it's not a requirement. 
Well, maybe I'll just mention it in the meeting that uh, it is not required to have a roll call vote for the uh, adoption of the bills, approval of the bills, excuse me. And uh, if, uh, unless someone has an objection, I will just call for the vote. All right. So the big caveat to all this, and it's, I don't know if this applies to Zoom meetings, but if we were doing a meeting where there was no way to visually see how people voted, um, I think that I had to have to look, but I think our policy on electronic meetings may require a roll call vote. I can't remember. I think we amended those recently, but we'll have to see. We'll have to review that. But when a meeting is conducted entirely electronically or there's somebody participating electronically, I think there might be some requirement for roll call, roll call vote. So that's something to check into. You yeah, know, but probably that was intended for when people are phoning in and can't yeah. use their hands. I always interpreted it if somebody was in on the phone and not necessarily on Zoom. But I don't know. We'll have to, I think we might have to confer with Christina on that and, and take a closer look at our um electronic meeting policy so then declaration of votes um motions may be determined by vote or show of hands or at the request of any member by roll call and then uh, the chair is uh, supposed to declare how the vote turned out if if they remember to and it's always a good thing to do for the recording and especially for the clerk auditor who has to take minutes. <laughs> and then the chair signs uh, documents, contracts and agreements if they're approved. We used to, you know, at the end of every motion say, and, and sign, you know, authorize the chair to sign all associated documents. But we changed the policy to where that's just automatic. If a an agenda item gets approved, the associated document, the chair is automatically authorized to sign the associated documents. Uh, open meeting, Open and Public Meetings Act, the chair is actually required to provide the opportunity to all of the members of the commission to, um, to, to get the Open Meetings Act training. And here, you know, it says the chair may delegate that to the county administrator commission administrator. And I think we've already sent you out the link. So, I mean, it's not our job to force you to do it, but just provide you, you know, with that opportunity. But it is required that you do it. Otherwise we'll get dinged in our audit. Yeah. The auditor always checks. Um, and And then, so um, voting rights and authority, the chair, vice chair, and chair pro tem shall have the same rights to debate and vote in the council as any other member. The chair shall not make motions or second motions, uh, amend or substitute motions. You know, this is, this is a policy that we have. It's not strictly from Robert's rules. Um, Robert's rules discourages the chair from making motions, but they don't say that they can't do it but our policy says that they can't. So um, one thing to point out is that we don't follow Robert's rules to the T. Um, Robert's rules is just, you know, optional. It's not a mandatory thing that anybody adopt Robert's rules as their parliamentary procedure. So we do have, you know, some things that we mostly follow Robert's rules, but our, our um, policies and procedures can vary slightly from it. And in this, this is one of those cases where, where that's the, that happens. Um, you know, if you ever want to change that and allow the chair to make a motion, oftentimes the way that it happens is that the chair will turn the meeting over to the vice chair for that agenda item if they want to make a motion. But anyway, the way it's set up right now, it's, it's precluded. So is, do we have on our schedule what kind of going over these policies and seeing if we want to make amendments or do we just have to take the initiative if we wanted to adjust it's them? Not, it's not on the schedule. Um, so yeah, we'd have to, you know, take the initiative. It can be, you know, it depends on, on what you want to do. Um, it may be good to have a kind of a comprehensive review of these. Um, but we can also do just minor changes anytime also. Jay Lynn, Liz Tubbs and myself sat on a committee once where we went through and looked 
we took out that uh, part we used to have in it that the chair had to repeat the motion before calling for a vote, which added a surprising a large amount of time to the meeting. So that's one thing we took out. So, and, you know, unless it's been changed a lot, the chair just can call for the vote after them. Yeah, unless, uh, you know, somebody can always request that the motion be repeated. Yes. But we used to do it, it would had to have, it was in our bylaws that you would repeat the motion <clears throat> before you called for the vote, which was very, you know, especially those motions that no one discussed. So yeah, we, I guess the, the things I had in mind, which we might want to take a look at, one, one is the, the thing that Chris just mentioned about the chair and not being able to second or make motions. I, I've never really seen the point in that. Um, and then the, the other is the way that you know, substitute motions are handled. Um, I don't know if that's coming up in here, but. Um, yeah, well, we can talk about that. I actually, I mean, there, uh, I wrote that myself and I think it's pretty important. The, I, we can discuss it, but. Yeah, um, so let, let's, let's Chris and I discuss it. Well, so, yeah, and we can go over the way it is right now and, and I'll give a quick rationale for it. Um, there's some capacity to do things differently in a lot of boards. They allow friendly amendments. I think that that's a really terrible thing and causes all kinds of games to be played. Um, and and I'll, when we get to it, I'll talk about it. <clears throat> so uh, council of the, or the county administrator, commission administrator, uh, this needs to be updated anyway, because now we've got two of us. We've got myself and then Mallory, who's the associate, associate administrator. But um, in general, council administrator acts under the direction of policies adopted by the governing body and in accordance with the provisions of the um, job description. And then, you know, specific directions received from the uh, commission as a unit. Again, kind of getting back to the, to the concept of, of directing staff um, as a result of the commission's decisions as opposed to independent uh, commission commissioner's direction. And then, you know, day-to-day -day guidance if needed is received from the chair uh, with regard to the commission's majority decisions. And then uh, administrator prepares agendas, um, you know, and that's obviously in, in coordination with the vice chair and the chair and does all the noticing. Um, we also um, prepare for the council meeting or workshop a packet, which you know we post to uh, the county's website. And uh, Tara does a lot of that. Mallory also attend the meetings, obviously. Uh, sometimes participates in study committees. Um, it's also the administrator's office responsibility to track, you know, postponed items or items that for future consideration so they don't just fall off the map. Uh, make sure that all the documents get signed and delivered to where they need to go. Um, also, you know, provide, um, you know, copies of Robert's rules and uh, uh, county land use code, general plan, bylaws, um, you know, a lot of the stuff's available on the website, on our website also but uh, we can try to pull more of this together and just kind of um, maybe send the full uh, list of links out. Um, Ruth used to create, you know, like print all this stuff up in a big book that was like five inches thick, but that's kind of old school. Uh, I guess if you want everything printed up, let me know and we can, um, but otherwise there's electronic versions of all this available. Um, you know, a big difference between Ruth and I is that, you know, I've uh, gone almost entirely paperless. And so try to avoid printing anything um, if possible. Sometimes we have to, but it's, you know, maybe like 1% of what it used to be. Uh, any written comments? So much nicer. Without the electronic part is so much nicer. Those big packets we used to get were cumbersome and a waste of paper and hard to get from one item to another. Yeah. 
You know, in most contract, the state allows um, the signature of contracts to happen electronically for everything really, except for anything that has to be notarized. So, you know, even signing documents can happen el entirely electronically and be legal. Okay, uh, written comments, any written comments from the public um, regarding council action or public hearing shall be compiled and forwarded to the clerk aud auditor. So this is in relation to public hearings. So when a public hearing is opened and through its duration, you know, when it's indicated to be closed, uh, the clerk auditor really needs to keep um, all of the, those comments associated with the public hearing. Um, on the record, so to speak. And so, um, you know, we forward that out in the packets. All the pertinent public comments end up in the packet, which is forwarded to the clerk auditor. And so that stuff kind of exists um, in that state. Study committees, uh, the commission may choose to appoint a committee of its members or Grand County residents versus of researching, reviewing, and recommending uh various things um committees are not executive bodies and the committee chair has no executive authority so you know this is just making it clear that study committees are advisory in nature and don't make any decisions um so won't really go too much into that um then you know committees should not consist of more than three commission members and that's um for the purposes of complying with the Open Meetings Act. Council meetings, uh, we have to comply with the Open and Public Meetings Act for council meetings. Um, there's regular meetings that um, uh, are the meetings that we advertise at the beginning of the year that we're gonna have, you know, more or less uh, every first and third Tuesday. And uh, also we usually advertise if needed, you know, the fifth Tuesday of the month. Um, there's a couple exceptions. Uh, we try to avoid holidays and uh, election day. So some of them are not um, the first and third Tuesday, but mostly they are. There are two alternatives to that. Uh, one is to call a special meeting, which requires that the um, clerk send out five days notice to the commissioners. That's not five days notice to the public. That's just five days notice to the commissioners. Uh, or at least all the commissioners that were not involved in the calling of the meeting. So for instance, this is a special meeting. It's not a regularly scheduled meeting. And, you know, I, I uh, included all the commissioners in my communication um, about this meeting. So it complies. Um, if, uh, if we want to call a meeting, uh, that special meetings still require 24 hours of advance notice and you know meet the criteria uh, for um, informing the commissioners of the meeting within a particular time frame if uh, some some true emergency pops up um, we're not absolutely required to post within 24 hours an emergency meeting although we're you know strongly encouraged to encode but emergency meetings are possible um, without 24 hours notice so you know, those are the three types of meetings that are possible. Uh, approval of the annual meeting schedule. Uh, that's just something we do every year. Dates and times, you know, which we've established. Um, in here in policy, we've kind of established, you know, the normal meeting time we'll begin at four. And then, you know, sub some public hearings, especially financially related, require uh, public hearings after 6 p.m. You know, for each public hearing, you've got to look at statute to see what its requirements are for noticing and, and times and whatnot. Some public hearings, you know, can be held at any time. Others have to be 6 p.m. or later. So we kind of track all that. Uh, special meetings, uh, you know, as, as necessary, the chair can call on those. And emergency meetings was already discussed. Um, workshops are, you know, the, when we tag on to the, usually the beginning of a meeting, oftentimes if we need to do a workshop, um, we'll tag it on to 
uh, the beginning of a regular meeting, usually start at two or something like that. Uh, but there's also the possibility we can do a workshop, you know, anytime as a special meeting, if it's not on a regular, regular commission meeting day. And then, you know, we sometimes do joint workshops with other entities, mostly the city of Moab, but sometimes others, travel council, planning commission, et cetera. Um, this part right here is, is the agenda and we kind of lay out, you know, the format for, for the agenda. Um, and, you know, it's not set in stone, you know, there's some ability to tweak it, but this is just the, the you know, the standard format and the way that it proceeds. Um, you can change that if you want. Um, that's something, you know, that commissioners have changed in the past. What comes first uh, or, you know, the priorities of the meeting. And so one of the things um, that Mallory and I try to emphasize as much as possible for everybody is that we try to um, establish a deadline. It's basically the Wednesday at 5 p.m. before the next meeting is the deadline for getting agenda item requests in and, and associated documents. You know, and for extenuating circumstances, we'll push that out as far as possible, but we really do, um, it helps us out a lot if you can get any agenda item requests in with associated documents um, by the Wednesday before uh, the next council or commission meeting. The, you know, and then we, uh, the chair, vice chair, and office, uh, commission administrator's office reviews the, the submissions. Um, and then it, it, mo most agenda items, it's up to the chair whether or not they make the agenda, except for items specifically requested by commission members. So commission members can always get something on the agenda and the chair doesn't have the, the discretion to deny it. You know, the only caveat I would say is that um, the request has to be legal. Um, there's been some requests to take action without, you know, the proper notice or the public hearing or whatever. And so I think that, you know, accepting a request that's illegal, um, a, a commissioner can request something to be on the agenda and there's not really any discretion on the matter from anybody else. And then, you know, we, we uh, prepare the agenda, send it out to everybody for review. And then uh, commission members shall have 24 hours or less to request changes to the draft agenda once it goes out. Of course, we, you know, push that out some if necessary, but it's helpful, you know, to be timely with a lot of this stuff because the... Um, Chris, the wording of that item C seems a little funny to me. If it's 24 hours or less, then that could mean they have like 10 minutes to make changes if, or was, I would just thought 24 hours or more would be the intent there. Uh, I think once, once the agenda goes out, the intent is that if you have changes to the agenda from when we send it out, that you get those changes to us within 24 hours. Okay, but, but is, the, is the intent saying we have, like if I'm planning on waiting 23 hours, am I safe or is it gonna get finalized after you know, seven hours or something? It, it sounds like it means you have up to 24 hours to request changes, is that correct? Yeah, by policy, like I say, so if we send out um, the draft agenda for review, addition, corrections, et cetera, um, that the commissioners will have 24 hours after that to request changes. Okay, yeah, so maybe just striking the or less. Uh, so yeah, it really should be yeah up to instead of or less. But I mean, in practice, uh, you know, we'll accommodate beyond that. And so this is really kind of, you know, the suggestion, if you can, um, it's not uncommon for us to, I mean, it's possible to actually technically possible to change the agenda as long as it's um, less than 24 hours before the meeting. Once we hit that 24 hour mark, whatever we've posted for the agenda is what it is because you can't change it after that. 
Um, and again, I, you know, I wasn't disagreeing with the policy. I just, I just thought the wording of this thing didn't reflect what we intended. Oh yeah, that's probably not. It, it could be reworded. And you know, if you really read this, you'd probably find plenty of things that could be reworded. Um, so yeah, the intention there is up to 24 hours. Okay. And I don't know, yeah, that or less is kind of funny. And then, you know, the administrator, the, some of these are kind of holdovers from a, probably a bygone era, you know, printing everything up. But uh, if somebody requests, a, you know, a printed copy of the agenda packet, um, we'll produce it. And same with the library. Um, on occasion, there are some things in a commission um, meeting that can that require the provision of confidential or protected information. And uh, we'll usually, you know, we don't include that in the packet. Um, we provide that usually in a confidential email or whatever. Um, you know, that would usually it would, it would relate to a closed session item. And, you know, closed sessions can be for discussion of the character and competence, uh, professional character and competence of an individual um a variety of things it's usually professional character and competence or um real estate negotiations those are legitimate closed session topics there are other others that are um possible as well but considerably less used so chris is, does the county maintain like an official repository of the, the packets for past meetings uh, well, they're they're all available on our website. When you go to the agenda center, okay. So that that's the definitive source, and that. That's yeah, I mean, and we have them on our drive too, on our administ administrator's drive. Okay. Uh, we don't have paper copies uh, anymore, anyway, but they do live on the county's website and on the administrator's server. Server. Okay. So yeah. Um, then this section E is just covering the noticing requirements from statute. Um, we have to, uh, post to the public notice website and the county website. Um, and those are two different things. Um, and then notify the public newspaper of record, which is the Times Independent. And so that all is supposed to happen for every uh, meeting. And then um, copies of the agenda shall be made available to the public at the meetings, you know, and, and so when we get back to meeting in person, we have a little um, dais type thing that we put the agendas on that, you know, if you walk through the door, they're right there. But right now we're providing them electronically via our website and the public notice website. Um, here, you know, it's, you know, as far as practical posting deadline, as far as practical 48 hours in advance of a meeting, but no less than 24, 24 is the state law, 48 is just sort of, you know, if possible. And then here where, you know, is the section relating to agendas and gender summary deadline, um, 5 p.m. on the Wednesday prior to the regular meeting. Or, you know, it's it's for the purposes of, you know, giving us the time to get everything together. We try to have um, the packet and everything done by Friday. So, you know, if we can get everything in on Wednesday, then we have um, a couple of days to pull everything together. But, you know, it, it's problematic to get things in late for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes they require review uh, or, you know, it's difficult to fit them in. If we number the agenda and lay everything out in a packet, it can be a little bit different, you know, difficult to renumber the agenda if something comes in late. It's not impossible, but, you know, it just takes more time. Then legal review, um, this says 14 days. The county attorney's uh, current policy though is four weeks. So um, just, I guess, be aware of that. If you have an agenda item that requires legal review, uh, Christine has requested that you get it to her a month ahead of time. And um, there's no real 
hard gu guidelines on what requires legal re review, but certainly all land use related issues, anything that's an agreement or an MOU for sure. And some other things, you know, depending on what they are. Um, in here, you know, ordinances, resolutions, MOUs, contracts, agreements. Those are the main ones. Uh, the consent agenda, um, the consent agenda is created, uh, you know, to quickly process or dispose of non-controversial matters. And so, you know, if you feel like you've got an agenda item that's just a slam dunk, doesn't require discussion, and you think it will get a unanimous vote, you, we can put it on the consent agenda. Um, and then uh, we also recently inserted, you know, an, upon unanimous consensus of the members or a motion and a majority vote, any item may be removed from the consent agenda for additional consideration during the meeting. So if there's something on, on a consent agenda that preclude, would preclude you from voting in favor of the consent agenda, um, you can ask for it to be taken off and voted on separately. That way you don't have to vote against all the other things on the consent agenda. But you know, the point of this is to try to have one motion that gets, gets a bunch of different agenda items approved quickly. So does the chair just kind of like group things together that they think would be uncontroversial? Or is that the staff? How, how does it decided? Uh, the chair is the ultimate you know, person that approves the agenda and but staff oftentimes will make suggestions for things to be on the consent agenda. And then it'd be best, I guess, if we got if we noticed something during the draft phase and took it out. Yeah, I mean, that would be best, but it's not absolutely necessary. You can always ask for something to be pulled in the meeting itself. But yeah, when you review the agenda, you know, take a clip take a look at the consent agenda and see if there's anything you object to in it. And if there is, we'll just pull it out and make it its own agenda item. So then we got a description of the commission chambers, um, you know, and disorderly persons, you know, maybe removed um, by law enforcement at the request of the chair. So then on to voting. Um, one thing that's important to realize is that no, regardless of how many commission members are present, we need four affirmative votes to pass any, any motion. And, and there are a handful of um, types of motions that actually require a supermajority, which would be five. But most motions only require uh, four. But even, and so what that means is if there are only four commission members present, all four of them have to vote in favor in order to pass something. So this, this requirement for four is regardless of the number of commissioners in attendance. Then we've got um, this conflict of interest provision, um, which Christina uh, and others have uh, recently updated. There's two different, you know, levels of conflict of interest. Um, trying to remember what the terminology she used for each of them. The, the lesser of the two just requires disclosure. And you, what, we should get you this ordinance number 593 if we haven't already, so you can read it. Um, and then the, the greater conflict of interest um, not only requires disclosure, but also requires rec recusal from discussion and the vote itself. And so usually um, it, it depends, the, the distinction between the two is whether or not somebody's got a direct involvement um, in something, especially a direct financial involvement versus just an incidental involvement. So, you know, if we're, if we're going through the process to revamp some section of the land use code and it just happens that you that it could affect you um you know that's one of the lesser you know it could be considered one of the lesser uh conflicts of interest as opposed to let's say for instance you were the actual applicant of the land use code amendment 
um, and, you know, had some direct financial involvement in, you know, that obviously require recusal. But, and if you have any questions about, you know, the distinction, uh, Christina is always available to help make those distinctions. They're not always entirely clear, so it's good to seek um, her opinion on those things. If a commissioner just decides uh, to not vote, then it will be considered an abstention, which um, always, you know, the, the effect of an abstention is basically a vote against because it, you know, um, we require affirmative four affirmative votes to vote in favor of something. So um, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't count for a, or an I vote. And so, you know, the effect really is an abstention is a vote against, although um, technically it's not, but that's generally the effect. Tie votes, I suppose. Um, this is kind of a weird one. Tie results in the defeat of a proposed action because it failed to gain the four. So, I mean, technically speaking, you would never, it wouldn't be possible to have a true tie vote um, prevail because all votes require a four four affirmatives to pass. So that, that one's kind of weird. But anyway, if you get three to three, for instance, it can't pass because they're not only because of this provision, but also just because the we require four to pass anything. Um, leaving the seat when I call for the vote is commenced, no member shall leave until the vote is disclosed. Uh, Maybe this was put in there just because some commissioners um, stormed out of the meeting before the vote was taken <laughs> as a result of a contentious discussion. I don't know. I mean, that has happened. I don't remember why this was put in there, but it does happen that commissioners get you know up, so upset that they'll just leave the meeting. So what happens then? I mean, is the vote postponed? No, I don't think anything would happen. The vote would just go on. Um, I mean, I guess that person would technically be in violation of policy, but that doesn't really mean anything. I mean, one thing to realize, I guess, uh, about policy is that you can't be taken out of office for violating policy. There's very, very narrow um, guidelines for how a commissioner could be actually removed from office. And uh, violating policy is not one of them. So, I mean, these are, in general, I guess I would say, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to play nice, these are the ways to do it. <laughs> because we can't really force anybody out of office if they don't follow policy. <clears throat> so I think if somebody did storm off in the middle of a vote, it would really, nothing would happen. They just wouldn't vote. It would be a no vote. <laughs> So then here's another policy. Uh, member may change their vote after the call for the vote has been completed and before announcement of the result, but not thereafter. Um, it's not entirely technically true because somebody could make a motion for reconsideration. Um, but within the context, the strict context of that particular vote itself, you know, if you want to change your vote, um, you need to speak up before the chair um, calls the vote uh, and completes it. Um, abstentions, uh, I guess they're kind of discouraged here, but certainly they happen. Uh, members are permitted to vote for themselves for an office or other position. That's so, sometimes people think that it's a conflict of interest to vote for yourself. For instance, if somebody nominates you to be chair or whatever, totally fine to vote for yourself. So it's, that's not a conflict um, when you're in those kinds of circumstances. So then uh, making a motion, uh, when a motion is made, the chair shall call for a second and then um, 
restate the motion upon the request of any member. So not automatically restate the motion, but upon the request of some member, they can. And then if a motion receives a second, the chair has the discretion to restate the motion um, after the vote commences. If the chair, if there is no second, the chair shall, the motion shall die without further debate due to lack of a second. And a motion may be, not be withdrawn by the person making the motion without the consent of the majority of the council, uh, councilman has been seconded. And this kind of, we're starting to get into some of the um, points I'd like to make. Um, Robert's rules is really set up to equalize power among the, all the members of the board. And so the reason why a motion be, falls into the ownership of the full board after a second is made is because if that were not the case and the person that made the motion had some kind of extra powers or advantage because they made the motion, like for instance, there was the possibilities of friendly amendments and whatnot, then it creates a situation where um, commissioners start playing games where they they're try, they try to get their motion in first uh, because there's a, a slight advantage to that. And, um, and then the chair also could um, provide that slight advantage by who they choose if two people put their hand up first. And Robert's rules is drafted to preclude any of that kind of stuff. Um, and that's why it's important that once a motion gets uh, made and seconded that the motion is then in the ownership of the entire board and um, it can't be amended without amended or substituted without uh, four affirmative votes. The other thing to talk about here is that technically speaking in Robert's rules discussion shouldn't occur until a motion's been made and a second's been made. Um, it's pretty rare that that's followed. Discussion happens all over the place, whether a motion has been made or not. But I'll just point out that technically speaking, in Robert's rules, discussion is not supposed to happen until a motion's made and been seconded. So I, I clearly have to study a little bit more about Robert's rules, but in this case where I know friendly amendments are allowed, if you, you just make a secondary motion or something. Uh, yeah, and we'll get to we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I, you know, like I say, some you know we we could draft a policy for friendly amendments if you wanted, but like I say, it causes. Um, in my experience, when I first got on the council, friendly amendments were allowed, and it caused a lot of games to be played, and it just you know that shouldn't be happening. Could, could you clarify what you mean by friendly amendment here? So that'd be um, when uh, somebody makes a motion and then somebody seconds that motion and then um, an amendment is made to the motion without a vote of the full board, but just by, by, the, by the approval of the person that made the motion. And okay. sometimes the person that made the motion and seconded it. But so the, amendment, the amendment doesn't get approved by the full board. It just gets approved by the person that made the motion. And that's not how it's supposed to happen. So in, in particular, you're taking the, like, you know, I make a motion to, you know, to do blah, 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 and it gets seconded and someone immediately points out, well, you forgot mm -hmm. you know, to say thus and such, which you clearly meant to do. And I say, yep, you're right. You know, yeah. To do that? Um, technically, yes, but you know, one way to, I think that would be easy, that would also follow Robert's rules is the way we could um, allow amendments by unanimous consensus as opposed to a vote, which we've put in here for the purposes of expediting some portions of parliamentary procedure. So the chair would say, does anybody have an objection to this amendment? And if nobody objected, then it's done, as opposed to empowering the person that made the motion and the person that seconded it to control it. Um, <clears throat> and I think that that would be preferable to what I would call friendly amendments. It would just be an amendment by unanimous consensus. 
Because I, I think, you know, the situation where someone makes a motion and it immediately needs some kind of uncontroversial clarification or wordsmithing, that's pretty common. And I would think we would want to streamline that. Yeah, uh, we could. And like I said, I think it would be easy to do. Uh, you know, like I say, by just by providing unanimous consensus, because then you're giving the full board the opportunity to, to, to you know, um, concede to that. Okay. Or if somebody objects, objects. If no one, if no one object, if, you know, if this is happening before any discussion, any substantive discussion has occurred very shortly after the motion's made, mm -hmm. Eric could just let, let it change, assuming no one objects, object. Yeah. Well, and that also gets to the uh, substitute motion, which. We'll get to that in a minute. We're coming up to it. But. Um, uh, anyway, division of motions, I guess if somebody makes a long convoluted motion that in includes multiple parts, the chair could request that it be split up. Uh, and then motions out of order. Um, sometimes, you know, I guess the chair can um, rule that a motion's out of order given the point of the meeting that we're in. Uh, can be overruled though by a majority vote of the commissioners. Uh, here's a reconsidering a motion is often um, misunderstood. Uh, so uh, the reconsideration of a motion is only in order during the session that the original motion was made. Um, and so in, so let's say in a meeting, a motion's made and passed. And then later in the meeting, somebody says, oh, we screwed up. We need to reconsider that. Uh, that would be a reconsideration of a motion. And in order to change that within the same meeting, somebody from the prevailing side of the original motion has to make the motion for reconsideration. And then you vote to reconsider the motion and then um, uh, you know, proceed from there. But in a different session, in a different legislative or executive session, um, there is no such thing as a reconsideration of a motion. If, a, if you're trying to change an, a past action it doesn't require somebody from the prevailing side to make the motion if you're in a different meeting. You know, and if you think about it, that's important because let's say you're trying to change something that happened so long ago, for instance, that there's nobody on the commission that's of the prevailing side. So, you know, it, it, people get confused about that, but just realize the only time that somebody from the prevailing side needs to make the motion is when you're trying to change a vote that happened in that meeting. And then when we change, go to a different meeting and we're trying to change a prior vote, it depends on what the vote is. If, it, if it's trying to change something that um, has a binding effect of some kind, like a agreement or whatever, there's a process that we'd have to go through to you know rescind that approval or terminate the contract or whatever. But if there's no real binding effect, you can just make a motion to do something different and, and go forward with it. Um, it, kind of, it just depends on whether the prior motion had any binding effect that needs to be undone. And, and so in particular then, because I think this came up this past year once or twice, um, if you know, something's on the agenda and it fails, you're saying there's no restrictions on someone just bringing up the exact same thing the next meeting? Um, no, there's not. I mean, a commissioner can always, it depends on how you, let's say we're talking about a land use code decision or, you know, a decision that's land use application related. There's a couple options that the commission can take. One is just not to make a motion. And in that case, you know, there's no denial. And so technically somebody could bring that back and vote on it as if it never was voted on or brought up in the past. If, however, there's a motion to deny the application and that passes, somebody would have in a later meeting would have to make a motion to rescind that denial before 
they would be able to approve it. And if it's denied, you know, I guess we'd have to talk with Christina, but I think if, if something's denied, the applicant would have to reapply and go through the whole process all over again. If the count commission just takes no action, then it kind of leaves the door open for them to be approved later without reapplying. Okay. So it really depends. Sometimes commissioners don't take action because not because they're totally against the project, but just because they, they're not seeing what they wanna see presented to them as a, a in, you know, in the options. And so sometimes it makes sense to take no action and give time for other things to happen. And sometimes you're just dead set against it. And in that case, I'd recommend making a motion to deny. Okay. <clears throat> And then um, postponing a motion is when you want to move a, uh, an agenda item to another date altogether, another meeting. Tabling a motion is when you want to um, just put the agenda item off, uh, but revisit it in the same meeting later. So people will get these two confused, but just try to remember that postponing is when you want to move it to a totally different meeting tabling is when you want to just sort of bypass it and come back to it later, but in the same meeting. All right, then getting on to amend the amending motions and substituting motions. So the difference, you know, between these two, I generally recommend, you know, that let's say somebody makes a motion and you want to change it, or even the person that made the motion wants to change it. Um, I tend not to recommend using the motion to amend unless you expect that multiple people might have amendments to add. So let's say, you know, we're working on some big complicated revision to a document and there might be multiple amendments made. Um, then it really makes sense to use a motion to amend to leave the door open for other people to contribute amendments as well. And then you'll vote on each amendment, but the, the, the full motion is not disposed of yet until the main motion as amended is voted on. So it's a two part process. Somebody, or really three parts. Somebody makes the original motion, then somebody makes a motion to amend, which is either approved or not. And then finally, and, and those and there can be multiples of those. And then finally, um, once all the amendments are done, everybody's made their motions to amend that they want. And then, then the final call is to approve uh, the motion with all the amendments that pass. So it's a little bit of a longer process, but let's say for instance, somebody makes a motion and you only have one single amendment for it and you don't expect that there's gonna be any others. It's easier to just do a substitute motion because then you skip the part where you vote on the sub, you know, you vote on the amendment and then you have to vote on the amended main motion. It's just a faster part of the process. Um, so anyway, um, Kevin, did you have something you wanted to talk about with this one? Yeah, I, I, I think the problem I see with that and is that, you know, the person making a substitute motion doesn't know and the chair might not know if other people have amendments in mind. And so the fact that it just ends the debate and closes everything out immediately seems kind of problematic to me. Well, um, if somebody, if that is the case, then the, the discussion, um, the person who, who has that point to make would bring it up in discussion. And if they can convince the majority of the commission to, 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 to um, not do a substitute motion, then. Um, yeah, but, but to me, it just seems better if we just use ordinary amendments. You know, I, I, I think the, yeah, I can see how there are pluses and minuses in each of these, but you know, if, if the people who are interested in an amendment maybe need a lot of discussion to convince people that their amendment's a good idea. 
I, I just, I don't like the fact that this substitute motion just, you know, ends it right there without giving other people a chance. And I know they can speak up and say, I'm opposing this substitute motion, even though I agree with the substance of it, you know, I, I would like to make further amendments later, but they don't get a chance to, you know, extensively make their case. So. Well, they do. Yeah. I don't see why they wouldn't because there's discussion associated with the substitute motion. I, but the chair might, you know, want to try to confine discussion to the, you know, the substitute that's on the floor rather than some future amendment that hasn't been made yet. Yeah. Well, um, it would add a lot of uh, voting if we did that, <laughs> because I mean, you can do it any way you want. I think that um, substitute motions are established part of Robert's rules, you know, and um, actually looking online, I'd, I kind of came to the opposite conclusion that they were kind of frowned upon. I mean, I, I guess there are different rule versions of Robert's rules out there, but yep. I mean, you certainly one can make an emo. A, I could make an amendment that would just, you know, delete the, all the original motion and put in this totally new one. And that's sometimes called a substitute motion, but it would still require the, you know, the double vote at the end. Um, yeah. And, you know, like I said, I mean, if you guys want to not use substitute motions, then just don't use them. Um, uh, I think the vast majority of the time, it's far more efficient because usually I'd have to say this, um, Substitute motions are usually people just correcting errors, you know, or or after the discussion on the main motion, everyone kind of decides that a different motion really should be made. And so instead of doing the double process of doing the amended motion, they just make the substitute motion and vote on it and done with it. Um, I would just say that if you if you don't use substitute motions, it's just going to make a lot more process that's unnecessary. A lot of the time, I, I grant that sometimes the situation you just described does occur, but I, I'm still bothered by the. I mean, if if there were some ways where someone you know just a single member could object, and then we're not doing a substitute motion, we're just voting on a regular amendment, that would make me feel more comfortable with it. Well, it gets back to the point that. Once a motion is made and seconded, it's in the ownership of the full body. And if the full body votes to proceed with a substitute motion, then it's the, that's just it's tough luck for the people that are against it. <laughs> you know, and that's the way that it is for all these things. And so it's just a matter of, you know, of putting the, the power and the ownership of any motion in with the majority of the, of the board. Right, and, but I think the two alternatives are distinguishing, but both score equally in terms of that power arrangement that you mentioned. Yeah. I, I think the only disadvantage of using ordinary amendments is sometimes you, you, it requires an extra round of voting. It's, it's yeah. not a... Well, like I said, I mean, I guess if you guys want to get rid of the ability to do a substitute motion, you can, you know, just do that. But I would, I'd recommend you wait for a while to see how things play out, because I think you'll see that substitute motions are very... Uh, useful. Okay, well, we, we can continue, can continue to discuss and think about this. Yeah, but I mean, I guess I'd say that, you know, the, the will of the commission, uh, as, you know, as four members, at least, it can't be subverted by either. Um, but anyway, that's something to consider, I guess, later. And like I said, I mean, I would recommend, you know, like just, you know, getting through maybe six months of meetings before we really start tweaking parliamentary procedure, just to see how everything works. And then recessing the meeting, we kind of recently drafted that the chair um, can recess uh, the meeting or reconvene it uh, by unanimous consensus or majority vote. So 99% um, of the time, everyone's in agreement when we need to recess and reconvene. And so, you know, the chair has the ability to say, unless anybody objects, we're recessing without having to do a whole motion and vote and everything like that, which saves a lot of time and trouble drafting the minutes. <clears throat> and then um, Robert's rules of order. So, 
you know, if the if these uh, policies and procedures don't cover something, then we revert to Robert's rules of order. Like I say, you know, these aren't exactly Robert's rules of order, but uh, anything that's not covered in this, you know, we basically say we we revert to Robert's rules of order. If there's something question that comes up that's not addressed by these policies and procedures. <clears throat> And then uh, reading the passage of ordinances. Um, this kind of covers the process for passage of ordinances. I don't think we have to go through it too much, but. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say it's getting close to three. Maybe we should. Um, yeah. So. The remainder of the agenda. Yeah. And I mean, we can continue on with other workshops if we want. This is really the most important thing to cover because this is going to be, you know, advising you on how to do most of what you're going to be doing um okay I but just, these two things i mean one thing to, the only thing to realize about ordinances is that by law an ordinance can't take effect until 15 days after its passage so kind of keep that in mind um it's been an issue in the past uh but if you, you know if there's some deadline that you need an ordinance passed by just realize that it won't be effective until 15 days after you pass it <clears throat> Decorum and debate, uh, you know, generally speaking, um, it's good to get the, uh, to request it being recognized by the chair before you start talking and try not to talk over each other and interrupt each other, give each other um, time. And so, you know, the chair will uh, call on somebody to, to speak and, um, you know, obviously don't interrupt somebody else when they're talking. Um, and, you know, decor use decorum, I guess. Um, and also, you know, we discourage getting into a debate with the public. If somebody in the public disagrees with you, try not to get into a big fight with them in a meeting. Um, And Mary can kind of go into it, but I think that the chair generally tries to give everybody a turn to speak before they call on somebody to speak for a second or a third or more times. And so try to keep that in mind also, like if you've already spoken, allow the other members who want to speak to speak first for their first time before you try to get your second statement in, you know, and, and it's really kind of the chair's job to try to also manage that to call on everybody who wants to speak first before we give somebody else a second round of speaking but um can be you know if if everybody starts talking over each other and not paying attention to this decorum it, it looks really bad for one and it's very ineffective so uh, yeah try not to do that and then electronic devices um Shall be limited to matters pertaining to the business of the meeting and subject to the Open Public Meetings Act. There's actually some elements, I think, of the Open and Public Meetings Act that precludes commissioners from texting each other uh, during a meeting. So just be aware of that. If you're like trying to secretly communicate with another commissioner in the meeting via text, um, I think that there's some laws against that you're really supposed to provide your, or at least as long as, as much as it, it pertains to the public's business, and especially if there's a motion on the table. So, you know, any debate or, you know, discussion on a motion really should, should be happening in full view of the public. And then, you know, leaving the chambers, um, if you need to, you know, uh, leave the meeting is it's generally best to you know let the chair know that or you know ask for or to be excused as opposed to just disappearing <clears> then <throat> participation from the public um there's some you can read all this in your own time but generally we try to limit citizens to be heard to three minutes per person or and oftentimes the same thing in public hearings 
Uh, we do have two citizens to be heard sessions now in our agendas, one at four and one at six. And we've also changed it to where citizens to be heard are intended for items both on the agenda and not on the agenda. And the point of that is to try to make it so that once an agenda item comes up, that um, we've already heard from the public on the matter, unless it's a public hearing. If it's, if it's a public hearing, then we'll take comments during the agenda item. But if it's not a public hearing, the kind of the point is that at that point, it will be time for the commissioners to discuss and make statements and to not get involved in a debate or a discussion with the public during the agenda item. We are wanting the public to provide those comments during the citizens to be heard portion. All right, and then generally speaking, you know, sometimes you get requests for citizens to speak on other people's behalves um, or to, you know, give their time that's left to somebody else. We don't allow that. All right, yeah, this is taking a lot longer than I, than, well, it's taking a long time. <laughs> I knew it would take quite a while, but um, some of this did, I'm trying to scroll through to see which things we really need to cover. There's a process for amending these policies um, and then just some backup. All right, let me switch over and see what we've got next on our agenda. Commission's role on boards and committees. We kind of already covered that. Um, um, Chris, can I ask a question? I'm trying to look for this document that you're looking at. It's uh, not the commission packet that was sent to us, is it? This isn't in it. I thought that this is what mine says, commission orientation 115.21 packet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's not what you have? I don't know. I just can't find where you are. The tabs are. Uh, can you see? Uh, I don't know how yours works. Can you, what kind of program are you using? I can see the bookmarks. They're just different. It's okay. I'll look around. Uh, I might be using one that wasn't, uh, I am using one that I downloaded before Tara put in the uh, new form of government. So my page numbers are probably different, but other than that, I think it should be, uh, a lot the same, but I am looking at the agenda itself right now. And so um, there's the commissioner's role on boards and committees. We already covered that commissions meetings. We've covered that uh, along with meeting types, meeting location. Um, right now we're meeting on Zoom, but you know, if we ever get past this COVID stuff, we'll be back in the commission chambers. We talked about, you know, the timeline and the deadlines um, for agenda items and agenda summaries. I mean, I guess one thing, uh, we have a, a, a form, an agenda summary form, a uh, blank one that we can send out to everybody so they have that. If you have an agenda item, we request that you fill out that agenda summary form. So I think the next poignant thing is to discuss the Open and Public Meetings Act. Um, trying to see if we've got anything here. Okay. Um, so, I'll just try to give a, a quick 101 version of this, but the definition of a meeting is um, basically any time four elected officials um, convene to discuss the public's business. Um, that's the very abbreviated version. And it could be electronically or in person. Um, if for instance, you encounter four other com or three other commissioners when you're out or more and um, in like a social gathering or just a chance occurrence, that's fine as long as you don't start talking about the public's business. So just be aware that, you know, the qualifier really is, you know, a quorum of commissioners and a discussion of the public's business. So, you know, if you do happen upon each other socially, just try to avoid talking shop, so to speak. Um, and, and just realize that the, um, a meeting isn't defined by, you know, physical presence or meeting on Zoom or anything like that. You know, it could be via email and all these other things as well. So 
um, just be aware of that. Um, there, you know, you're all going to take the open and public meetings training that's online. And so I won't go into a ton of detail about it, but, um, the, the other thing to talk about are, are closed sessions. Uh, closed sessions are allowed for limited things. And, you know, those will, will you'll learn about also in uh, Open Meetings Act training. For the most part, we have closed sessions to discuss professional character and competence of an individual or real estate transactions or reasonably an imminent pending litigation. Those are the three main things. We can also go into closed session to discuss collective bargaining, which is uh, related to unions and organized labor negotiations. Uh, I've never gone into closed session to discuss that, but it's possible. Um, but does anybody have any questions about open and public meetings? Um, yeah, I, um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not looking for loopholes here, but I was looking through the 2016 Grand County packet and its section on open and public meetings. Like, and, I, and it, it, it sounds, it sounds a, a bit narrower than what we usually talk about. Like it has to be convened by a person with the authority to do so. So it says explicitly in the 2016 version that if it's a social chance social meeting, even with a quorum, that can't possibly be, you know, count um, because it wasn't convened. Uh, I don't, I don't remember that one. Is that, is that an expert of state code? Yeah. Um, but anyway, I don't, I don't want to take up now. So maybe okay. just when we get a chance. Well, I mean, I would, I would look into it because uh, that would be a super easy loop loophole. If all, if all you had to do to get out of the open and public meetings act is to not convene it. <laughs> I just yeah. don't, that seems like there's something about that. That's not accurate. Um, okay. Well, but maybe, Sometime, but, at least but yeah. Um, send it to me if you want me to have a look at it. And like I said, that just seems like too easy of a loophole. But oftentimes, you know, my recommendation if you're in doubt about something, err on the side of uh, caution. Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with that. And, and just being transparent. <laughs> uh, moving on to grandma. Uh, Government Records and Access Management Act. Um, this is a really complicated uh, statute, uh, but essentially uh, anybody has the ability to request records, government records, and that includes emails, text messages, any kind of electronic recording, um, all kinds of documents, et cetera. There's a pretty long list of things that can be protected for various reasons. Um, but I would recommend to the commission that um, the only thing that, that I would consider to be protected is your communication with the county attorney. And everything else, I would just assume until proven otherwise that it is available to the public if they request it. Um, but there are a lot of exemptions to that. Um, and so if somebody makes a grammar request, they put it into Quinn, the clerk auditor, who is our grammar officer. And then, you know, he'll work with me and Christina Sloan on whether or not we can release the records. Um, and sometimes they or oftentimes they include commissioners, emails and electronic communications. And so if that happens and you get a grant and we get a grammar request that involves you, then we'll send out a request for you to provide those records to us. Um, the person making the request has the ability to appeal the decision to me um, and then I'll make a determination. And then they have a third, you know, another chance to appeal to the state records committee if they don't like my decision. Um, but generally speaking, I'd say that you, it's your safest to assume that most of your records and communications are, are something that would have to be disclosed if requested. Hey, Chris, how do, and as far as text messages go, I, I regularly clean out my text messages. Does that mean I should keep text messages where I, where I communicate with another member of the, uh, council? 
or commission? Um, I would say if it's substantive, you're supposed to maintain those records. Um, I mean, if it's just like, what time's the meeting <laughs> or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah right, right, of course. That's not something you have to keep. I, I think or, Matt Sinicero sent out something earlier yeah. that gave a, a list of things that should be retained. I right, he did, yeah. I actually, I, I, yeah, that's that's a good reminder, Kevin. I should go back and look at that. So, I yeah. I about that. Like, it, it refers to, like, if you're on the list with a bunch of people, it basically says you probably don't have to keep it. Um, is that because the, the sender keeps it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, they should, yeah. Um, one thing I'll say that I've noticed when, I, when grammar requests go out to the commission, and this happens often, is that when commissioners respond, um, it becomes clear that they didn't completely respond because there'll be communications that other commissioners will send in that include them and things they said, but they didn't send their documents in that have those original communications. And so the person receiving that information could easily see uh, that one of the commissioners didn't respond according to law because of the copied communications that come back. And so kind of just be aware of that. Um, and so generally speaking, I wouldn't go through a big purge of deleting records um, until you're you know, ready to leave office or something. Um, there's you know, a way to just archive emails that you want to get out of your inbox. And so you don't have to see them without deleting them. And so I just say, you know, be somewhat careful about using the delete button to clean up your inbox. But at the same time, it encourages people to get rid of like transitory emails and just like. Yeah, Matt's, Matt's handout was basically telling you to delete things immediately unless it's on the following list. So he was arguing to err on the other side. Well. Your email is a powerful resource for you too. So if you delete a bunch of emails, you're going to be disadvantaged when you're like, "Oh, I, I, there's something about that, but I need to look in my email." <laughs> so I don't delete. I don't delete. I don't really delete anything except for just like junk mail. I'll archive everything that's even just that I'm copied on. I'll archive it because, regardless of of those retentions uh, schedules. Um, it's useful to me to have that information. I use my email as a powerful resource because my so, brain can't remember everything. So with that, just like clarification on it. So at the end of our term, we'll be expected to go through our email and send certain things to like the official archive. Well, I, basically what happens at the end of your term is that um, Matt will want to archive your email and so what he'll ask you to do is delete everything um, that doesn't need to be retained, which is a big job. And so it is kind of nice to do that as you go. Otherwise, you're going to deal with 100,000 emails or however many you have by the end of your term would be impossible. And we're just talking about the Grand County official county email addresses now. Yeah. So, um, so that, or does the county, like if a grammar request comes in, are you and or Matt or, and or Quinn just able to search our county email server for things that happened on that account? Uh, I don't know. I, I assume we could, we don't. Yeah, the short answer is we, no. I mean, Matt, well, Matt could. I mean, Matt could access anybody's email, um, but we don't without permission. And so, I mean, if you wanted to say, help me find something, uh, but we, generally speaking, put the request into you, and then it's on you to provide the information, to do your own, to search through your own. Nobody goes and searches through your email. So technically, it's possible, but it, that doesn't happen. <clears throat> so it's on you to comply with the request. And if you don't, then, you know, the consequences will be on you also. <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, how often is there a grandma request? All the time. Uh, <laughs> not all of them relate to the commission. 
right. uh, you know, we probably get, I don't know, at least once a week, maybe Quinn or something. Yeah, I was going to say not every week, but most weeks there's something. And then it depends on what's going on. Sometimes some something will be happening when we get a flood of them. Is it generally the press or? Yeah, a lot of times the press, you know, just been dealing with some from KSL and others, you know, searching for stories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, it depends on what's going on. Like I said, if there's something contentious going on, people will try to find out the backstory. You know, put in a grammar request for all emails pertaining to blah, 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 contentious issue that's on the agenda so just be aware that if something's contentious that there's a higher likelihood of uh, grammar request but you know oftentimes it's just like some people are put in a lot of grammar requests that's what they do <clears throat> anything else with uh, open and public meetings or uh, grammar All right, so also in addition to the, gov the policies of the governing body, there's a whole bunch of um, county policies, purchasing policy and a whole bunch of other policies that are personnel related, uh, conflict of interest, all kinds of things. Um, and a lot of those really need to be updated. And so you'll probably see in the first half of this year, quite a few um, policy updates. Unfortunately, they're not really all comprehensively arranged in one easy location. Um, and so um, that's something I wanna do for you is to put together really sort of just a, a compendium of all of our policies. Um, our employee handbook, um, which may be, I think, let's see. So yeah, we've got it in the packet. There's been several amendments to the employee handbook um, that haven't been yet codified into the employee handbook. So the employee handbook itself is somewhat out of date um, with regard to amendments to it. Um, but there is some policies that are, you know, probably you should be aware of. We had to um, create this personal use policy, which is a policy regarding the personal use of county property and uh, it's fairly vague. And so if you have any questions about personal use of county property, uh, you can ask Christina and I, you know, so people might say, well, is it okay for me to use the county's uh, iPad to do personal email? Uh, yeah, generally speaking, that's fine. Um, but it's not okay to take the county's car and go shopping in Grand Junction, <laughs> you know, so. It, there's a there's a concept of de minimis use, um, and it was intentionally left vague. But um, if you do have questions about that, ask about it before you know you use the county property in a way that you're unsure of. Um, so I had a question about um, something you said a moment ago about is there a an archive somewhere of just county ordinances or resolutions? You know the sort of the outcomes of meetings. Um, sort of. I've, uh, I've begun to compile all of the resolutions and ordinances into one place and I've, I'm having uh, Tara, our office assistant, go through them one by one and categorizing them all and trying to determine if they need to be codified into our 17 titles of uh, ordinances or, or what needs to be done with them. One thing to realize is that our ordinances haven't been codified and by codified, I mean um, incorporated into all those 17 titles of ordinances that you can see on the county website uh, since I think like 2006. So there's a lot of catching up to do. Um, and, uh, and so that's a process that I've initiated and I've created a, uh, an index of all these things. So we do have them all um, and they're searchable. It's a pretty big, I could probably upload it to a Google Drive or something um, for everybody. Well, but it's in it's process, right? What's that? At the moment, it's just in your Google Drive. It's not a publicly available. Archive. 
Okay. No, it's not publicly available. It should be. Do we need like some kind of formal county like budget line item and resolution to say that we want to get this happening? I, I um, think uh eventually yes um the codification requires commission approval for sure and probably commissioner interpretation as well because if there are multiple ordinances that are passed that are conflicting with one another you'll have to decide which one prevails um and that could be the case and you know uh we won't know until we get through it all but that's the problem with not codifying on a more regular basis is you're not really you can't necessarily always be sure that you're not trespassing on prior uh, ordinances without repealing them. I generally um, recommend, you know, repealing and replacing as opposed to amending um, ordinances, just because when you repeal and replace past ordinances, you know that the one that you just passed is the definitive ordinance, whether just, and if you just do amendments, uh, a series of amendments. You have to track back to the original. It's very complicated. And so uh, Christina and I and others have, have really kind of started doing a lot more repealing and replacing type ordinances because it's cleaner and much easier to know what the most, the latest, greatest version of something is. But um, you, we'll probably use the same code publishing company that we use for the land use code to do our codification and so it will be similar to how our land use code codified you're probably familiar with that kevin yeah but yeah a big process so I, i'm just i know it's makes it harder on you if there are formal expectations and deadlines but i i do think it's important like should we like had set goals for getting some chunk you know certain titles done or you know certain milestones along the way uh yeah i mean if you want it's um at this point you know it's just like when somebody has free time that's what they work on okay. and so um i don't know i mean if you've got free time we'll send you a chunk of ordinances and you can start categorizing them <laughs> um because there's many yeah and and we have to figure out you know how they apply and what effect they have to actually know how to codify them, you know? Okay. Well, maybe this could just be a discussion item in some future meeting where you could yeah. let people know what's happening now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, with regard to fleet policy, we do have you know requirement that if you're gonna drive a county vehicle that um, you take a defensive driving program or training. Um, and let's see, is Renee on? Are you on, Renee? Yep, I am, Chris. Anyway, maybe this would be a good time for you to kind of just um, take over and, and go over the things that you wanted to cover. Sure, I'll take just a few minutes on the handbook. Can I share my screen? Yeah, hold on. Sure. If I can get back to... Okay, go ahead. All right. Maybe. There it is. Okay. So it's not my plan to share, to go too deeply in depth on the employee handbook. Um, I think if you, I would urge you all to, to take a look through it and read through it. Um, it is kind of the policy in which um, employees, all employees should conduct themselves. Uh, I do have big plans for the employee handbook this year and hopefully um, we'll get some of it presented to you. I would like to have an updated version, uh, hopefully fully approved by, by July. So um, there are some policies that are, are out of date. So I'm gonna hop to a few that I think are kind of most of interest. Um, so on one page 192 of your packet, the most updated packet, uh, I do want to just point out as a commissioner, uh, let's not be writing letters of recommendation for staff. 
um, those those requests, if you get a request to write a letter of recommendation, um, should technically be approved by me if you're writing them in your official capacity um, on Grand County letterhead. So I would suggest not to. If you would choose to personally write one for a staff member, that's that's on your personal um, kind of will there. Next thing I'm going to hop to is interviews. Um, our hiring process is all kind of written out here. Uh, anytime there's a posting live on the Grand County website, you are welcome to, to send that out to anybody you think that the posting would kind of pertain to if they have an interest to it and have them go through the application process uh, listed on the website. Sometimes there may be the department head or elected official may ask a commission member to sit on the interview committee. Um, I would just say that interviews are should be treated like a like a closed session, so nothing should leave the interview, and not to to reach out to any candidate until an official um, announcement for the vacancy has been made. We've had some issues in the past. I know when in the last meeting. Uh, Quinn stated if anybody wants to come in and see the bill process and how we pay bills, uh, that he can go to their office. My office does handle payroll, so I'm happy to, to sit with any commission member and walk through, through the process of payroll. Um, it's a fun and interesting process if you ever have any questions on how payroll is conducted or how we pay, pay our employees, um, please let me know. Um, I'm gonna hop to workers' comp next. Uh, workers' comp is also handled out of my office. Uh, anytime there's an accident, it does go in front of the accident review committee. Um, it's an established committee with, with a few members of, of certain departments, including myself and Jana Smith, who's our insurance coordinator out of the clerk's office. This workers' comp section just kind of gives a, a basis of, of what we look at in a workers' comp claim. I'll walk, I'll skip to the discipline section. Um, this kind of gives an our outline of our discipline philosophy and, and kind of things that employees can go through. The next thing I'm gonna kind of hop to, and it's also, I believe in the um, commission member, what Chris was presenting on earlier, uh, your policies and procedures, but the, the commission does, serve as kind of the final appeal should the dis dispute resolution process go as far as going to the county commission. Um, that is the final answer. And so really there's only four reasons why you should see something come to you in that, in that capacity. That's suspension, transfer, a dismissal of Grand County employment, or somebody feels like they have been unlawfully discriminated against. So this kind of just gives that process. And then the last thing I wanted to hop to was just 319. I know we've talked about it a little bit. This is the ordinance 593, um, going over the ethics and conflicts of interest. I have received a few of your disclosures uh, for 2021. We file those yearly. So every year I will ask for those. This ordinance go does go into great depth about what's restricted and non-restricted. Um, I wanted to point out on page 327, oops, too far. Uh, that after I collect all of the disclosure statements from all of the county staff um, by January 31st, then my next step is to take them to in front of the audit committee, which is made up of, I believe, three commission members. I know Mary and Kevin are on that committee. I'm not sure of who ended up being the third, uh, but the audit committee then votes uh, on any restricted or non-restricted kind of determination on the disclosures. And then they do go onto the commission agenda, um, generally the consent agenda to, to kind of finalize those disclosures for the year. Um, and that's really what I wanted to go over as far as the employee handbook and, and kind of employee things there. So if I have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any.
Does anybody have any questions about uh, payroll or anything like that, you know, with regard to yourselves or how all that works? Or bi biweekly? Um, and commissioners um, don't get any benefits other than those required by law. So FICA, Medicaid. <clears throat> Did, did, did our payroll start on January 1st, Chris? Yep, you should have had your first direct deposit actually um, for that first half half of a payroll. Well, you um, did, when did they, so, well, you, you got sworn in the first Monday. So the fourth. Fourth. Well, technically, yeah. So um, for those who, you know, who are, and then, you know, Sarah got appointed at a different date also, so. Got um, it, right. Technically speaking, you should your payroll should start um, that noon on the first Monday, uh, which was the fourth. Um, and I so it might have to be prorated. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. I think mine would be the same. Oh, yeah, yours is the same. So, yeah, you you got appointed us on on the fifth, so one day oh. later. <clears throat> Um, so maybe, yeah, so, that first one, Renee, would have to be a little bit prorated. It was prorated, Chris. It was for one one week. It should have gone in on the fifth or on the fourteenth. So just oh, yesterday I, on Thursday. I guess is there, um, is there a place where we can access a payroll stub, or will something get emailed? Or yeah, absolutely, Jacques. I will send that out to you. That was also in that new hire paperwork I sent you. Um, uh, yep, great. on how to access your payroll stubs. Thank you. Absolutely. And so does, let's see, does anybody else have any questions for Renee? She's our personnel services director. So she covers HR and payroll. But yeah, it might be worth reading through the employee handbook um, just to get an idea of, uh, you know, what it contains. Um, certainly more poignant for the most part to um, other employees in the county than the commissioners. Um, but useful to know nonetheless we do have a um a, a pay for performance program or a merit program and uh you know what that entails is is annual evaluations there's a kind of a lower level of merit increase called the milestone and you know every two years if an employee uh, meets the de minimis requirements of their job they get the milestone and then there's a an exemplary program where somebody creates what's called, an, uh, I believe, interpersonal development plan. Is that right, Renee? IDP. Individual development plan. Individual. Individual. Yep. And, and uh, if they meet the um, goals that they set out for that, that they're eligible um, every two years also for uh, a step increase. A step is a 3%. Um, increase in, in uh, salary or wage. And so those are offset usually. Um, and so if somebody's enrolled in the exemplary program, they'll get a milestone one year and then the exemplary increase the other year, alternating like that. Not everybody's uh, enrolled in the exemplary program. And so that's our merit system. Um, and uh, maybe something to consider, but um, elected officials are not included in that program. Elected officials have been getting COLAs and that's it. Um, and that includes the other elected officials besides the commission. So it does create a bit of an issue for some of the career, you know, um, elected officials because their staff advances in salary a lot faster than they do. And it gets to a point where you know like a chief deputy could bypass their elected official they work under in salary pretty easily well that's just you know issues to discuss down the road um anyway any other discussion on personnel related uh topics all right um, on the financial end of things real quick, um, maybe I'll just kind of cover the payment of the bills. So 
the way that works is is basically they're ratified the bills are paid usually um before they're approved and there's you know some process that makes it possible to approve them before they're paid but i guess um in talking with the auditors that's very rarely used by any government entity and would be pretty difficult to achieve um but the, nonetheless, the bills do need to re, be reviewed and approved, even if by ratification. Um, that usually kind of has fallen on one commissioner to kind of take the responsibility of um, reviewing the bills, making the motion to approve them. Um, but I will say that in recent history, the commissioner that does that hasn't actually reviewed the bills or substantively reviewed them. But that's certainly an option for any commissioner. Um, but the, the timeline for it can be a little fast paced, especially for paying you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the way that our timeline's established right now, um, the payroll from the pre, or not the payroll, but the payroll and the bills from the previous week is uploaded, uploaded to our general ledger um, on Monday. And then, you know, hopefully we get on Monday also the, the report on the bills to be paid from the prior week and then approved on Tuesday. So reviewing them is would be, you know, a kind of a heavy lift if somebody wanted to do it. But I would encourage encourage a commissioner to do that. And it's useful if just, you know, somebody uh, somebody gets familiar with the county's accounts and, and the whole process and kind of commits to that. It hasn't happened in recent history, but um, we do have invoices, receipts, et cetera, saved for all of our expenses, those kinds of things. So if a commissioner is inclined to review the bills, um, let us know and we'll, you know, try to work that into our process. Um, it can be fairly complicated. Um, with regard to budgeting, um, for the last couple of years, we've um, done most of our budgeting with the budget advisory board. And I'm the budget officer, and so I'm the chair of that board. There's also a couple uh, commissioners and some of other members that, that get appointed from the county um, department heads, and also one uh, member of the public. And so that's that board generates uh, the tentative budget that gets proposed to the commission and the commission uh, then approves that tentative budget in early November. So the budgeting process usually starts uh, in September. By November 1st, we have to have a tentative budget approved. And so, you know, the, that period of time is where the budget advisory board is working. Um, the point in time that the tentative budget is approved is kind of the point in time that the budget advisory board passes the torch to the commission. And then between uh, November and the point in time that the budget's approved, which has to be by the end of the year, uh, the commission will make tweaks or you know make final decisions about major elements of the budget like COLAs, new position requests, capital projects, um, a lot of the larger expenses or the more discretionary expenses. Um, those are the things that the commission would address and, and anything else they want to. So um, typically we will schedule the public hearing on the budget first meeting in December and then schedule action on the budget in the second meeting in December. And so Chris, this whole budget procedure, this is new within the past, what, four years or something roughly or what? Yeah, I think we started it in 2018. Yeah, 2018 is, I think, when it started. And, and, and was it, I mean, was, was there an existing thing that it modified, or is this just something you made up? Or um... uh, No, actually, I think Curtis Wells pulled it. It's something that other counties do, and so it's a fairly common thing, I guess. And Curtis Wells, um, I think, crafted the Budget Advisory Board from other counties, and then uh, the commission uh, adopted that as their process. And okay. so prior to that, um, the, the budget officer was the clerk auditor, and uh, she would 
meet with all the department heads and whatever commissioners were interested in attending to develop the tentative budget. And uh, back then it was all um, done on paper. And so uh, I can't even hardly imagine doing that anymore, but we have um, budgeting software now that we use and also um, a lot of Excel spreadsheets with analytical um, analysis capacity that we use also. And so uh, we've done pretty well. I would say that um, really tightened the budget up a lot and um, it can be a pretty arduous process for some. Um, no, no, I, I, I had sat through a lot of the meetings this past year and um, you know, I, I thought it was a good process and I thought you did a good job sort of leading the whole thing. And I know most people aren't gonna, you know, most members of the public are not gonna sit through all that, but if a member of the public did want to, I, I think they'd have a really detailed view of, yeah. you know, of how the money's spent and how we make decisions down to even the, the smaller items. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to see past all the numbers, the sea of numbers that budgeting is. But you do have to realize that, um, you know, budgeting really enables, the re enables reality. And so for the most part, this is not entirely true, but for the most part, if you don't provide resources towards something, then it's not gonna happen. And so uh, you just have to realize that what happens next year is largely dependent about, uh, upon what you budget for. And so it's really a very powerful tool and it really should be done with uh, you know, a strategic vision in mind because it's a prioritization process. You're saying, what are the things that are important to us? And again, you, you have to be able to look past all the numbers and all the math and see it for what it is, which is a prioritization process and a strategy process. And so um, I think it's really important and it, and it can be daunting because the financial, the fi financial accounting of the county can be pretty complicated and require a lot of institutional knowledge to really fully grasp. But um, I think that it's worth it for the commissioners to try to wrap their heads around it um, because it ties in with every other aspect of the county. And just by studying the budget, you really get a much more comprehensive understanding of, of what's going on across the entire county. I mean, it's not necessarily poignant to everything that the commissioners um, are interested in, but it's, it's uh, something that can really help a lot in just understanding how the county works and what's going on. So could you go over the, um, the various levels of say, you know, mid-year budget adjustments from, I guess my understanding, if it's not changing very many bottom lines, then it's- Yeah, so state, state law requires different process for different types of budget amendments. And so there, there are things called funds. And the way that we distinguish funds is, is generally by, by how we can spend the revenue so the general fund is the place where we deposit, you know, for the most part, our unrestricted revenue. That's revenue that can be spent on any legitimate government purpose. And that's gonna be a lot of um, our sales and use taxes, uh, not including the tourism related ones, which are restricted. Um, and then general revenues um, from fees and, and those kind of, and fines and forfeitures and all these kind of things. That's the general fund. It's kind of more of the unrestricted revenue and expenditures. And it also includes all the elected officials and, and most of the county's departments. And then we create other funds when we have major sources of restricted revenue. So for instance, we have the roads department, which is its own fund. And uh, it's, it's separated into its own fund because the transportation tax that funds it and the B road allocation has to be spent on transportation. And so there's a variety of other funds that are similar, you know, funds for the travel council, um, which are TRT related, and then the, another fund for the mitigation side of the TRT, et cetera. I won't cover them all, but in each fund, once you set the budget, the bottom line can't be changed without going to a public hearing. And so if you're going to, or it can be increased anyway, it can be decreased, but if you wanna increase the bottom line of any fund, which generally 
means either bringing more revenue in or bringing more um, money in from savings. If there are, is a fund balance in that fund, then you have to go to a public hearing. However, if this, and that's kind of like the highest level of budget amendment. If however, within a fund, there are multiple departments and you wanna transfer money from one department to another, but the bottom line stays the same in the fund, then that requires commission approval. And then the lowest level really of budget amendment is where you're moving money around within a department, but the bottom line for that department remains the same. And then uh, in that case, state law uh, gives the budget officer and the department head the ability to do that without commission approval. Um, generally so speaking, is that potentially, you know, suppose we put a line item, you know, that we want, you know, five thousand dollars, you know, some large amount spent on some specific thing. I mean, it would seem a little funny if just the department head with you know without the commission he maybe even know, being notified would change that. Uh yeah, and so I, I guess if you want more um I mean you're always it's always possible for you to pass a financial policy that requires um a greater level of process than state law requires. Okay. Um, and it went, I don't think it would be super onersome, onerous, really. Um, we don't get a huge number of budget amendments. Most of them you probably wouldn't care about, but if you really want to approve them, you know, we can make that happen too. I, I suppose one possibility is just to have some big list of them that's similar to this ratification of the bill. So someone who's interested in the details can look through it. Mm -hmm. you know, gives people yeah. a chance to know what's happening. Yeah. And our budgeting software actually, you know, um, I've tried this in the past, but I make an account for all the commissioners so that, that you have to be on a computer that's tied to the, to the county server, which we have in the commission's office. But I make an account for all the commissioners so they can log in and um, have read-only access to all of the county's accounts. And, and the, you know, the, but the expenses compared with the budget and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I can train anybody who's interested in having access to that. In the past, nobody's ever taken me up on it. Um, sure. but it's there, <laughs> it's possible if you're interested. And so- um, But you have to physically be in the courthouse. There's no internet access to that. Yeah, you have to be on the server. Okay. So. But that's a possibility. And so um, for the most part, if, if it's you know, just some little thing um, that's not you know, politically relative, I'll, I will make adjustments to a budget. Like if somebody says, you know, I'm not gonna spend all my money in utilities, can I transfer it over to get some tires on the truck or something? You know, that's more the kind of budget amendments that I see. Um, but if, you know, if there's some expense that's 5,000 or more that somebody wants to change, I think that um, I would probably bring that to the, to the commission. I don't really make any, you know, like we've discussed some amendments to the advertising budget and the travel council, which technically I think, you know, I could do just working with the lane, but I'm not going to, I would bring, you know, big changes to the commission regardless. Mm -hmm. And we can establish a policy about that too. There's no problem with that. Um, and so that's just the process. Sometimes commissioners have requests to amend the budget also because they want to do something and there's not money for it. And so, you know, just be, I guess, just realize that usually if you want to avoid a public hearing, I mean, or all the time, if you want to avoid a public hearing, you have to transfer money from one budgeted line item to another. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just add money to the budget without going to public hearing. So why is a public hearing really that difficult? I mean, is um, noticing in a meeting that maybe no one comes to or something? Yeah, I mean, it's not that difficult. It's obviously a process. Uh, you have to do the notice. It's not something that happens, you know, um, quickly because you have to meet the noticing requirements and then have the public hearing. And then if we do our normal process, um, which is wait two weeks after a public hearing to make a motion, um, then, you know, we're looking at like a month and a half to okay. do it. It's possible. 
Um, and so it's just that that's the process. And I've never really seen um, anybody make comments on a budget hearing, except when we're doing a tax increase. <laughs> and then we get a few. And, and so, yeah, I don't think that it would be cause for alarm, but that's just, you know, just so you know, typically we, we try to stay within uh, the point of making a budget is so that you're, you know, working within those means. And so I generally try to transfer money around, you know, if we, if we're changing priorities and you're creating a new priority, you know, it's best to de-emphasize some other priority you know, and supposed to just continually increase the budget. Yeah, but you know, these days with our incoming revenue being pretty uncertain, one can easily imagine that there's something we didn't think we'd have enough money for and then. Oh yeah, and that's, you know, that's a good point. If, uh, even if, if we're projecting a lot more revenue than we thought we were gonna get, you still have to go through a budget amendment in order to use it because you got to increase the bottom line. And that's the other thing about government accounting people have a hard time understanding is that because there's no such thing as, as profit in government, all, all government money has to be spent for a public and government purpose. Um, we have, we do what's, what's called net, you know, net zero budgeting. And so the revenue and the expense have to equal one another. And so if there is uh an excess of revenue to work to expense and we have to budget to send that back to the fund balance and there are restrictions on how much money we can keep in fund balances and so um, when we budget if we make adjustments to the expense side we also have to make adjustments to the revenue side to re-zero everything out okay. Thank you. <clears throat> didn't want to take too long yep all right um any other questions on financial matters or budgeting? I know this is a lot to try to absorb, but hopefully this is like giving some help to you all. <laughs> and so I guess uh, the final item is just, you know, any other topics that you all want to discuss or cover. We've got about 15 minutes before 4 p.m. I think we've covered most of what I was, I had questions about. All right. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, if you have uh, any other topics you want more specific training on, you know, we can always schedule a workshop and, and go into things in more detail, or you can just ask me, call me, email me, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you, Chris. That was, that was, that was great, man. All right. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Mallory, I guess uh, we're done. So, uh, or Mary, if you want to close the meeting, is Mary still on or no, she took off, didn't she? So I guess, um, I guess I'll just uh, close the meeting. Thanks everybody. It is uh, 345 and we're closing uh, this orientation training meeting with the commission. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Right.